The early scenes in Mandy are tranquil. Nicolas Cage and Andrea Riseborough have a pleasant and loving life out in the woods, with him lumberjacking to earn a living and her working at a gas station. This life doesn't really interest Bev and I, although I did once work at a gas station and maybe she's always wanted to be a lumberjill. Yeah? <laughs> sure. I bet I'd be really good at it. <laughs> But in any case, we can respect that these two people were happy doing these jobs. Then a cult came and ruined it all. We're going to get into all that soon, but before things get too intense, let's get back to the tranquil talk and pour a lovely cup of coffee. You can go to a store or to a java joint and find whatever you want, of course, but we have an alternative, even if you're up on the Shadow Mountains. And if you're any kind of regular listener of this show, you know where I'm going with this. And where I'm going is to promote Spark Plug Coffee. Spark Plug is the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica beans in our home and native land, which is Canada. If you live up here with us, you will get your orders sent within a week. Americans will get shipments delivered in that same within a week time frame, but we Canadians won't have to drop any dimes on the shipping costs or loonies. Spark Plug has a whole lot of blends and roasts. Seasonal blends rotate throughout the year, too. And if you're hearing all this, but then worry that you can't get half calf or decaf, well, shut that down right now, because you can. Sparkplug knows that not everybody wants to be armed to the teeth with caffeine when they're about to go on a kill-crazy rampage. But before you go on that rampage and probably lose your entire mind in the process, sign up for a membership in Sparkplug's Autopilot Coffee Club. You'll get perks and deals, and you will save greenbacks on every order. You can even customize your membership to get your deliveries when you actually need them, not just every month like annoying clockwork. I don't need it right now, but it came anyway. None of that. Flexibility is the key, which proves right there that this is not a run-of-the-mill coffee of the month club. How do you attain such a beautiful bag of beans? Why, well, going to sparkplug.coffee, of course. That's sparkplug.coffee. Add a slash H-Y-E-S to that address, and you'll go to the page that will help you save 20%. Our H-Y-E-S promo code is the honey, if you like saving a little money. Okay, Red and Mandy go through some serious hell in this film, but we love the artistry of their suffering. Let's get into it, Bev. Cue them. And action! Have you ever seen... Mandy. Hey there, film friendos, and thanks a lot for downloading, streaming, or YouTubing the 583rd Primal Scream you could find here on the podcasting channel called Have You Ever Seen? Primal Scream, Have You Ever Seen? We review classic motion pictures and spoil them, so be forewarned that secrets will be revealed about this film today. I'm the vicious snowflake who appreciates a good Jesus parable, Ryan Ellis. And here's the raging lunatic who loves her favorite shirt... It's my favorite shirt. And can get stabbed in the side, but keep on ticking, just like Jesus. My wife, Bev. That's me. Red goes on just fine. Or does he? Is this one of those movies where maybe nothing else is real beyond the stab in the side and Mandy burning alive? We're getting ahead of ourselves. This is the fourth film on this channel we've covered here in our second, maybe, annual Revenge Month. Probably annual. The other three were Gone Girl, Foxy Brown, and Hustlers. Those had women out for blood after they were wronged. This time it's a guy who wants to kill others after his woman was the one who was wronged, very brutally. So the coming attractions trivia for Mandy. Nicolas Cage tells one of the oddest knock-knock jokes in the history of knock-knock jokes in this movie. What's the punchline? I can't remember. What was it? Knock-knock. Who's there? Eric Estrada from Chips. (laughs) I mean, as a joke, it works because it makes me laugh. (laughs) I saw Chips when I was a kid, but if you're... 30 or so years old. That'll mean nothing to you. Well, the movie takes place in 83. Okay, that's right. Dating. Okay, you got a good point there. And the show was probably pretty big around that time. This joke is, I think, his first line of dialogue, too. What a weird way to start this weird film. If Reb was actually a member of the California Highway Patrol, okay, I can understand that. (laughs) Out of nowhere. He's not a cop. He's not in a motorcycle. He's a lumberjack taking a helicopter to a truck. To home. (laughs) Anyway, weird. Okay, it's Miller time. Red Miller, was shown at a lot of film festivals throughout the first half of the year. Then RLG, that's the production company, released it 364 days before last week's movie, Hustlers, was released on September 14th, 2018. We think this movie is the bee's knees, but most other people did not. Mandy didn't cost very much to make, but it didn't even haul in two million bucks at the box office. But Bev, the movie's old enough to be enrolled in kindergarten, so please remind us what this decidedly not childish film is about, and give us a skinny on Mandy, and don't let your kids watch this movie, people. (laughs) Nicholas Cage is Red Miller, and Andrea Riseborough is the titular Mandy. Together, Red and Mandy lead a peaceful life in a secluded home in the mountains, until their neck of the woods is discovered by a demented, drug-addled religious call to kidnap Mandy and burn her alive in front of Red. Red responds by going mad and killing the cult members one by one. Also, the 
Black Skull guys who aren't really in their cult. Yeah, the cult adjacent psycho monsters. They were hired to get her. Or in a nutshell, Nicolas Cage just went about his normal life for a few days and Penos Cosmatos happened to film it. <laughs> I think I've used that one a few times before, that kind of thing. Maybe for Nicolas Cage in previous movies we've talked about. This is the seventh time he's come up on this channel, by the way. Well, this movie was well-reviewed by the critics. One of his better-reviewed movies, actually. Rotten Tomatoes, 91% of critics like this film. 7.6 out of 10 is the average. There are 253 reviews on the site and 67% of audiences, so quite a bit lower, but still a fresh tomato. For all the talk that Cage just makes a bunch of dreck, he has about 10 movies with 90% or more on Rotten Tomatoes, including this, and another 7 or 8 with 80% or more. So I'm going to defend him as I often have. <laughs> if you kiss a lot of girls, you get slapped a lot, but every once in a while you score. The Warren Baby maybe, theory. Yeah, maybe it's the quantity theory. If he just keeps making these movies, and I think he makes them because he wants to. I like being in movies, Gary. He just likes being in movies, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> How many movies have we seen him in where the movie doesn't necessarily work, but so often they are fun, unique ideas and newish filmmakers with small budgets, movies that probably wouldn't get made without him, and you can just see him having, like, the best time. What was that movie called where they go to, like, the Chuck E. Cheese place and it's Willy's, haunted? Willie's Wonderland. I would never recommend it to anybody who doesn't just like a good it. B. Well, it was a fine B horror film. The better example is Pig. Oh, which I didn't Which see. is pretty good, actually. Oh, I think yeah. that's available on demand on Crave or something. You can watch it. You should watch it. This didn't make the 2018 top 200 at the box office, like I said, in America. A Star is Born, we covered that January last year, was 11th. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was 15th. And, of course, Cage is a voice in that. And I said last year when we covered it that he was my favorite of the Spider-Men, although they're all good. And, of course, Miles is awesome, too. But he is a voice in that. And Green Book, the Best Picture winner, was 36th. So we've covered all of those. In fact, two of those just last year. This won the Saturn Award for Best Independent Film. Cage was nominated for Best Actor, and it won three Fangoria Awards. It's appropriate that this won the Saturn, though, because that's Cage's production company, Saturn Films. And they talk about Saturn and Jupiter during the dialogue when everything's still tranquil. Yeah, and he says and red. Saturn is his favorite planet that tracks. <laughs> and films like this don't get Oscar nominations usually, but music, makeup, and cinematography, maybe even Cage's lead performance, I think we're all worthy. Yeah, this movie's not for everybody. We've seen it twice. We've liked it. Well, like may not be the right word for it, but we certainly do appreciate it. It is one very interesting art film by Penos Cosmatos. What do you think of it this time? So, I think I might love this movie. Hmm. I really liked it the first time I saw it. And like you say, it's like with caveats because it's a pretty weird film. But I think the first time I saw it, I sold it a little short as this all-style, no-substance gore fest. A gore fest is never going to be the kind of movie that strikes my fancy. It just doesn't really turn my crank. I'm never going to seek out a movie like this, typically. But I think Mandy's more than that. It's so hypnotic. It's really visionary. Cosmatos is a really self-assured filmmaker, considering this is just his second film. It's just exhilarating to see art that pushes the envelope like this. It's expanding cinematic language, and it still just works as a piece of entertainment. And also, of course, boss move casting Nicolas Cage. The movie just doesn't work without him. He's perfect, and this is a platonic ideal of a Nicolas Cage movie. I think I read somewhere that he wasn't even going to be the main character, though. He would have been the Jeremiah Sand character. They wanted, wanted to wanted cast to him. Yeah, yeah. He wanted to be Red instead, and I'm surprised that they would have thought that wasn't a good idea. Elijah Wood is one of the producers on this, and I guess he met with Cage, and something like years passed between this being written, which is not unusual for Hollywood, especially for not a very well-known director, Panos Cosmatos. Even now, he's not that well-known by most people. And not having the star in your movie yet, even with Wood's name as one of the producers. But I guess they met, and he and Cage thought, this could work with you as the lead. I don't know why they wouldn't realize that in the first place. Maybe they thought he was too old. That's what it was, I think. They thought he was too old. He they is wanted too a younger old for the part, yeah. He's playing younger, and he pulls it off as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, he seems like he's too old for Mandy, but it's not out of the question that somebody his age would be with someone her age, or that somebody his age could have the experiences that he has in the film. Not that it entirely matters how old Riseboro actually is, but she was born in 81. He was born in, what, 50-something, 50 56, or what was it again? 64? 64, 64. I think he's 60 this year. So he's, yeah, 17 years older than her. That may have been the thing. They wanted somebody younger, and instead, okay, that can work, and then it really did. I listened to an interview with Cosmatos. He said they had the meeting, and he was like, I want to play Red, and they were like, okay, well, it was nice meeting you, and they kind of moved on, and he said that like a week later, he just had a dream. Cage was in the film, and he played Red, and it was great. And then he called him up and was like, I don't know what I was thinking. You can have the part. Although, pretty fun to imagine him playing Jeremiah. And if Wood played Red, Elijah Wood. 
He could have. I mean, he would have been the right age. I Although, I can't picture him playing that part. I didn't read that he was actually going to ever play the part, but being a producer makes you think he maybe was going to be one time. We just did Gone Girl two weeks ago, and Reese Witherspoon's a producer. That's because she was going to play Amy at one point, and then she realized when she talked to Fincher that I'm not right for the movie you want to make, but she still produced it. And maybe that's what was going on here, but I didn't actually read that Wood was even thinking about it. I can't see him being believable with these tactics. Cage isn't exactly Mr. Braun, but I can believe that he could fight these inhuman black skulls. <laughs> why are they inhuman? I know they took that drug and they keep on taking that drug and they're fucked up and all that. But why are they not human beings anymore? They are human beings. They, they don't just... seem like it. They make noises that sound like animals. Okay, I mean, the whole movie Demons. is taking place in an elevated reality. Well, I think it's barely on Earth here. However you want to think of it, it's an alternate universe. It's a fairy tale. It's not really real. And just like any normal slasher flick, the movie bears a lot of resemblances to Friday the 13th, starting with the fact that it takes place on Crystal Lake. And he does, Jason does start sounding like these roaring demons in this movie, in his own movie, in the fourth, fifth, whatever it was, eighth one, somewhere in there. And he comes back from the dead a hundred times. And there's definitely some bending of the laws of nature in all those classic slasher films that this movie's homaging, I guess creating something new, but there's so much love for the genre here and for that time and place in cinema in like 1983 when the slasher films were That's true. on the way up. I read a review that really smartly said that with a slight change of perspective, Mandy could be the origin story of a Jason Voorhees type killer because Red is completely mad at the end, covered in blood, wild-eyed, hallucinating. Who's to say he's done with his killing spree? You can make a sequel to this film where he just starts turning on innocent people and becomes like a monster in the woods on Shadow Mountain. Goes back and kills Carruthers, the Bill Duke character who helped him. Yeah. By giving him information and, of course, that crossbow, which was Red's, but then the bolts that he specifically made that be stronger. I don't know if that's why Carruthers made them stronger, was to defend against the Black Skulls, but he knows about the Black Skulls, so maybe he thought, I might want these for myself, and you apparently need them, so you take them and use them on these guys. And he does really fuck them up. Obviously, he fucks up the cult, the humans. I keep calling them the demons, the Black Skulls, because I think they seem like they are demons. But he needs these special weapons against them, and he does some awful things to them, understandably so. The fuck pig is the one, I guess, that raped that couple in that house. I thought that they were supposed to be in their lair. And I said, there's no way when Red's in the kitchen, it would be so clean. But you point out, no, that would just be this couple that lived there. They broke in. The fuck pig guy did what the guy in Seven who has to do the lust thing with that knife cock. I fucked her and I killed her. And he's hyperventilating that dude in Seven. This guy actually did the same. Well, I guess he did in Seven, but he does it to these two people. It looks like the man, especially. Maybe they both got this treatment, but... It's funny because I was thinking, we don't have a rape movie. Gone Girl has elements of that in it. Foxy Brown certainly did. I covered that by myself. And then Hustlers last week doesn't have rape, but some sexual politics. But this does actually have some. And it's actually surprising in a way that Jeremiah Sand didn't rape Mandy because he wants her so badly. But she does the thing that Robin Williams said was the best way to turn a guy off. Not in a rape situation, but just he wants to fuck you. Just laugh at his ass is what Robin Williams said. And then the guy would slink off in his joke. Well. As we know, a lot of guys might turn on you and, and hurt you badly. Alive, yeah. But just you think that he would maybe have raped her first. I'll show you. My cock isn't little. I'll rape you and then do what he does to her. And maybe he did, but we don't see any kind of rape. They just take her outside in that sleeping bag, hang her upside down. I guess they drugged her or something because she's not really making any noise or moving around much. And then she's lit on fire and Red has to watch that. She's writhing as soon as the fire starts. But she could have been drugged so that she can't really do much because she would think she'd be making more noise than she is. I guess I'll keep on bringing logic to an illogical situation. But yeah, the movie's like a fantasy. It invites you not to overthink it. It starts with the whole look and the style, which is incredibly surrealistic. And then the performances as well. They don't really talk or act like normal people. They talk really slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a 90-minute movie in a two-hour package. Well, the story is so slim. Mm -hmm. We weren't bored by it. It's not like it's too long and we didn't want it to go on. It's just that there's not that much story to actually play this out. But it's because Cosmatos really does drag things out. Not in a bad way, but he does. Including when Mandy's burned alive. That could have been cut down a lot. But it's partly because Red is so messed up from being stabbed. It's and a his grief. point for him. We have to rationalize that this man goes mad. One of the things that this movie does best, and I think that makes it stand out from other slasher films and like a lot of other films that have similar themes to this that really indulge in violence the purpose of a revenge film i think is to just give the audience rationalization to enjoy watching violence and all the titillation that comes with a violent movie but i wouldn't say that is what mandy really does the violence can kind of be fun to watch but i think it gets you so deep in red's head 
because it takes so much time to delicately and properly tell the story of Red and Mandy and illustrate their love and make you root for them. Mm-hmm. When you cast Nicolas Cage in your film in 2018, when this film came out, and honestly, for pretty much the 21st century, if Nicolas Cage is in your movie, you're making a promise to your audience. Nicolas Cage is here. Shit is going to hit the fan. Why <laughs> else would we have cast him? So from the first frame, his presence alone introduces attention. You're starting the film with a loaded gun. And then the film takes this hour to beautifully give Cage an opportunity to do something we don't see him do very often, which is play the warmth and vulnerability. And he really sells it. He's so beautifully convincing in his love for Mandy and his fear of losing this sweet little life that they've built together. That's like the bedrock of why the second half of the film, where he goes full Nicolas Cage, has this unexpected emotional resonance, even though it's silly, even though there's a chainsaw fight. Well, that's Even though, great. right? I mean, it's great, right? So you get the fun of watching a chainsaw fight, of watching this ridiculous slasher film trope, and done well too. But you also get the heartbreak at the end when he's crazy. The famous shot from this movie, one of the last shots in the film, is his blood red face, his crazy eyes looking at Mandy, who's not really there in the passenger seat of his car, mm. and the whole frame is red. Full Nicolas Cage, his performance is really on display here. In another movie, that would just be fun and silly. But in this movie, there is so much heartbreak with the fact that this man who had a good life, who has overcome trauma, we know that, he was a veteran. Him and Mandy both allude to coming from darker pasts and finding each other. And He's a recovering, peace. recovering alcoholic. Yeah, yeah, they allude to it. I don't know if they ever say it out loud, but you see him turn down the beer and then there's a scene in the bathroom. Why do you keep your vodka underneath towels in the bathroom cupboard? Because you're a recovering alcoholic. Mm. And then, of course, he just goes crazy drinking and doing drugs because he's going off the deep end. Yeah, he might as well. His life's over at this point. He would have no idea why this happened. He didn't hear the conversation that Mandy had with Jeremiah in the room. And, of course, it's way too far that he even wants to hurt her, let alone kill her. But as crazy as that is, she knows why he's upset with her. Red doesn't. Red never saw any of this stuff. I don't think Mandy necessarily would remember the children of the new dawn driving by and Jeremiah seeing her and being obsessed with this giant-eyed woman. It's not like she's Margot Robbie out there, but he's so obsessed, I must have her, and then send Swan to get her, and Swan's the one who hires the Black Skulls to do it. So yeah, these guys break into their house in the middle of the night. Red has no idea, I don't think, about the children of the new dawn, period, or the Black Skulls until all this happens. So it's not even a matter of him seeing these people and thinking, oh, that might be trouble. So many violent movies and horror movies have been about that. Oh, God, they're there at the start at that gas station or wherever it was, and they got in a bit of a scuffle. And then those are the people that come and attack you later, so you don't deserve it, but at least you know who these people are. He would have no idea who any of these people are, and he's barbed wire tied up outside, watches his girlfriend be burned alive, I guess we could say, speculating, we don't know she was in that sleeping bag. We don't know she's the one that burned alive. Yeah, it's a curious choice to not show her and make sure the audience knows that's her, but... We never see her again, so she's obviously dead. Yeah, yeah, she's dead. So here's a question, and it would fit with this kind of movie, I think. Is it possible he did get stabbed in the side, and his hands are tied with barbed wire, which is cutting into him as well, and his face and everything as well. They drive off. The cult goes to that church we see at the end of the film. Is it possible he sat there and died, bled out and died, and everything else we see is his imagining. This is what I'm going to do to you motherfuckers when I catch up to you. So it's possible, but it's no fun. (laughs) Well, of course it's never fun. Well, you love the vertigo thing. You think that when Jimmy Stewart goes to the insane asylum, the rest of the movie is his fantasy. Oh my God, Madeline's alive after all. She just duped me and I can get her back and I can make her be Madeline again. If she was an actress, a brunette, and now I'll make her a blonde. But I'm going to fuck that up because I'm nuts. That could be what happens with Red. He can't possibly have survived. Well, I guess he can, but he shouldn't have survived being stabbed. I never seen him really fix it up. Of course, we just watched that new Roadhouse movie where he gets stabbed by a switchblade early on and just puts tape over it. (laughs) I know that Jake Gyllenhaal is tough, but come on. (laughs) Maybe Gyllenhaal could have played this character too, actually, come to think of it. Yeah, I think he could. I mean, that man has range. He can play that stupid action hero, and I think I liked it better than you, Roadhouse. You did. But it was dumb. So if it is real, though, yeah, he slips his right hand out of the barbed wire and then crawls over, weeps over her ashes. And I think the most famous moment in the whole movie, the ending is pretty famous, yes. But when he goes inside, I guess you're right, it's their house. Because it seems like it would be the Sand house. Sand's people have left with him. Mandy's laying there, just a bunch of ashes now, and I guess her skull. And then I think the next scene after he weeps over the ashes, Red goes inside to the bathroom to clean up a little bit drinks all that booze, and then stands there and just screams. 
I think it was Roger Ebert that said about him a long time ago, and maybe 8mm, not a very good movie, but I think it was that review, where he said that Cage is the actor that can just stand there and scream better than anybody else. <laughs> he literally does it here, and it certainly does fit because of what he just experienced. One of the few scenes in the film that doesn't really have any overkill style put on it, the color wash... It's just more or less natural colors. No red the filters. The green isn't super heavy. There's yeah. so many red filters in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Red filters, purple filters, the LSD trails that they see. There's so much going on. The grain, the overwhelming grain. Yes. But in the bathroom scene, that's a little ugly moment in reality. Mm-hmm. When they're together and they're in love, they're in their magical world. When they're with the Children of the New Dawn, they're in this horrific version of that world but there's a few scenes where things just look normal and that's one of them also when she's in the gas station working that's the real world when they're like out there in the real world but he's screaming because the reality is crashing in i think yeah by the way i'm seeing my notes here that mother talks to mandy at the gas station so it's possible that that night and maybe that's the night when the black skulls come in and kidnap her and kidnap them But anyway, it's possible that Mandy said to Red that she met this weird woman. So maybe Red has some idea who the hell these people are. But still, it seems so weird to him. And to her, too. But Mandy's dead, so we're talking about just the person that lived. What the fuck happened? It's bad enough this happened at all, but who are you people? So maybe he had some idea who they were with that. I guess it's possible. When Swan does call the Black Skulls, he blows what's called an ocarina, or an ocarina, O-C-A-R-I-N-A, which is also known as the Horn of Abraxas. So this is getting deep, and I think Cosmatos... Knows more about that stuff than I do, I guess. His co-writers, I guess, also. And we see the leader of the Black Skulls guzzle, I guess it's LSD. Yeah. And I believe that's what Red does when he's in that house that they've left yeah. behind. And it works immediately it's on like him. like it touches his tongue. Instantly, he's gone mad. They keep doing this stuff, I guess, for years. That's what Crothers tells him, that they had a bad batch of it and they started going insane and do seem inhuman. So maybe that's what his future is going to be, too, because we always do what happens next. This is a great example of what the fuck does happen next? (laughs) What does he do? Maybe he turns into Jason Voorhees. I just don't see a future for him at all. I think his life is ruined. I see a future, though, for one other character that he does let live. The only one that we see in the whole movie, I think, that lives besides him. Well, Crothers, I guess, too. But that's any part of the bad guys. Let's go with Lucy's Revenge. Red did let her live when he killed Swan and the other two guys. He sticks the beast, that giant battle axe, into Swan's mouth, kills him, but he let her go first. These whack jobs were her family, though, so she going to be out for Red's blood. Of course, he should have already lost all his blood from the stab in his side and everything else he goes through in the movie. So he might not be around for Lucy to attack in the first place, but maybe Lucy's coming for him if he does go back to his house. Can you imagine, by the way, if anything like this happened, obviously not this surreal, but basically happen in your life i spit in your grave that movie for example how does she go back to any kind of normalcy how does he go back to any kind of normalcy you get the impression that he fought pretty hard to achieve the normalcy that he does have covered alcoholic and veteran living in the middle of the woods they have this delicate piece and he's lost it and there's these really beautiful and unique repetitive depictions of Mandy herself. Animation. There's the animation, and I think that's mostly after she's dead. Yes. And it's all in the style of that movie Heavy Metal from the 80s. Nobody really talks about it now, but there's this great movie from the 80s called Heavy Metal. There's so many heavy metal influences on this movie, just by the fact that it has no metal music in the soundtrack. But they're clearly metal fans, and the animation matches that style. It's very 83. And there's these shots of her where the camera just focuses on her, just pays great close attention to her, it'll focus on her scar. She must be wearing contact lenses because one of her irises is bigger than the other. Her eyes are enormous. Her eyes are enormous. She looks kind of like an alien. You know, there's a beautiful shot during the peaceful times in the first half. They go camping. She emerges from the lake. She looks almost lizard-like. You can see her sinews. and They don't make her look pretty at all. For this guy to obsess about this woman, it's not like he wants her for her beauty. I don't know if this is the point they were trying to make, but Mandy's... One of a kind. She has these unusual features. She's a strange girl. She's an artist. She's got this talent. And they fit perfectly like two puzzle pieces. And she's totally unique. So when Red loses her, he's never going to get that back. Because there's simply no one else like her. I don't know if that's exactly what the film is trying to convey. Or if they were just like, isn't it cool that she is one of a kind? So it's just ba- cool. So it's bad enough he lost anybody he loved, but somebody this special. Yeah, she's also a writer, and he loves what she's writing. She's doing the picture. Oh, that's what it is. She's yeah. an artist. Okay. 
But he comes home and tells the Erica Strata joke when she's been doing that for a little while. And she's slinging gas, which I've done, and it's a pretty boring job. <laughs> Pays the bills, though. Yeah, I was a kid she when I did it. She gets to read her fantasy novels. I was a teenager, early 20s, when I was doing it in the college days. As for Jeremiah Sand, played by Linus Roach, and pretty effectively, it's obviously a takeoff on Charles Manson, with his cult especially. I think they did drugs, didn't they? Yeah, they did drugs oh, yeah. in that cult. The LST specifically. And he apparently will take what is mine, is what he says to her. But then when he shows his dick to her and she laughs, Roach didn't really want to do the full frontal nudity. And I guess he thought about it and realized, no, it makes sense for this character. I'll do the nudity after all. I guess he was going to masturbate and he didn't want to do that. And that might have got this movie an X rating too. Not an X rating, what do you call it? NC-17 rating if he had jerked off anyway. So they couldn't do that and have this movie be marketed at all. It didn't make much money as it was. It would have made even less. But it's a pretty convincing performance by Roach. We've never covered him before, even though he's been working for 40 years or around 40 years. He played Thomas Wayne in Batman Begins about 13 years before this. But anyway, so he's Bruce Wayne's father. And the guy who plays the chemist, who we see towards the end of the film, plays Joe Chill in Batman Begins. So the chemist killing Jeremiah in Batman Begins is why Batman is born. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that was intentional that they cast the two of them, but Richard Brake is pretty effective in that one little scene he has towards the end. And he does the right thing. He realizes Red comes to get information, and he probably would have killed him, except the chemist says, I'm going to help you because what they did was wrong. And, and he it, leaves him alive. Right. He survives, too. Yeah, so that's Carruthers right. does, he does, Lucy does. There may be other people, too, but most people we meet in this movie, it's not a very big cast are dead when it's over. And of course, Red's still alive too, but then for how much longer? Mm -hmm. Well, is he alive? Because maybe none of that was real. For a movie that's not shy about creating these really fantastical monsters of people, what do they call the Black Skulls? Mm -hmm. They're so over the top and silly for the hero to vanquish these monsters. But Jeremiah, he's like a surprisingly straightforward depiction of that delusional narcissism covering up a fragile ego that is what I imagine most cult leaders are actually like. The minute she laughs at his penis, he goes from raving about her to, now you're a whore. Yeah, Which yeah. is so typical of what guys will do. I think you're awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna fucking kill you. And he literally thinks he's Jesus, but he can be... And talks to God. Completely, yeah, talks to God, but he can be torn apart by a woman laughing at his penis. And yet he treats Red like Jesus by stabbing him in the side. Because they do that when Jesus is on the cross to confirm he's actually dead, they take a long pitchfork type thing or a, what do we call it, a staff, whatever it is, and they stab him in the side. He doesn't react. Blood pours out and then that's the proof that he's dead. So that's one of the things that Doubting Thomas, I believe, sees when he's resurrected to prove the holes in his palms, of course, are a big part, but also the stab in his side, that this is the guy that we followed and he's somehow alive again. The difference, of course, is that Red <laughs> doesn't forgive anybody. He goes on a kill crazy rampage. The movie does have a lot of humor, though, for something that's so violent and often so sad including when he's tied up again by one of the Black Skulls guys, although he gets loose and kills him after trying to run down one of the skulls, but doesn't manage to do that. But he says about the guy ruining his favorite shirt, that was my favorite shirt, the 44 shirt. And we see later on in a flashback, he was wearing that when he met Mandy, which is probably why it was his favorite shirt. But it's a bit of humor in this, just like the vicious snowflake he calls one of them. Maybe one of the... F I think it's the same one. I was going to say fuck pig, black skulls, one of them. That's right. Isn't that scene yeah. when he's tied up in, the, was it the bathroom or something? Mm -hmm. The but second he, time they have him dead to rights and he somehow gets away. Which is, again, why it seems like it isn't possible. But then we've seen action movies where heroes survive everything. So why can't this movie do the same thing? And he is kind of less superhuman in his rage and in his pursuit of bloody justice. I like how when he finds one of the black skulls... He shoots it, him, whatever, in the neck with a bolt from the crossbow, and he pulls it out. Blood goes everywhere, as I recall, and he attacks him with the axe, but the guy still managed to say, the demon, whatever, still managed to, I guess it's a guy, she's still burning. Mm -hmm. What a vicious thing to say, mm -hmm. but if you're going to die anyway, you might as well get your last shot in, and then he gets killed by And the story red. is that they're sadists. They like pain, so he doesn't even care that he's being murdered. He likes the pain, and he likes inflicting pain, so with his dying breath... He reminds him that she's still burning. Mm -hmm. When he finds the chemist, by the way, there's the tiger Lizzie, which I guess was going to be a lizard, but then Cosmatos changed it to be a tiger, which I guess was on set with them, and that would be a little bit scary, even you know, it's trained. I saw Tiger it? King. <laughs> I have a healthy fear. I never saw that show. And when he tries to get up to them at that church, the Children of the New Dawn Church, which is in a quarry, the chemist just says north. I guess that's good enough simple directions again very simple movie but then it takes him forever to get to find them but his atv gets stuck and he's on his feet so he finds swan stabs him in the mouth lucy gets away lets her live he stabs hanker in the head using the beast the battle axe thing right in the top of the head and then the chainsaw fight with klopek 
the chain ends up around the guy's neck and he pulls him over top of his own saw, which is pretty smart because we know what's happening and it's a pretty grisly thing. It'd be, oh God, I don't want to think about that. And you see some things come flying up the sides of him, but it's not really as gory as it could be. Eli Roth probably would have blatantly shown the saw go through him, but it's a lot cheaper when he's just underneath and you have to have some effects to show that he's being ripped apart by his own chainsaw. As for that, people might say, chainsaw fight, what the hell? Well, if the bad guy has a chainsaw and there's a chainsaw sitting over here, what else are you going to use? You could use your beast, but it might not be as effective against a guy who's got a chainsaw, so you're going to use a chainsaw. Plus, he's a lumberjack. That's his trade. That's true. Yeah, he knows what he's what doing. To do with him. He's in his element. <laughs> and that giant long chainsaw looks made up, but we actually had a tree removed from our backyard last summer, and they used a chainsaw just like that, this right. super long chainsaw. And as far as the gore goes, the one that just got under my skin the most is Swan. When he sticks the knife down his throat and he keeps pushing, and it's right. because the actor's performance is just so placid throughout as he's making these noises, the gurgling of the knife going further down, and yet he still is just happily dying for his cause. Right. It's creepy. It got under my skin, man. Yeah, his god, San, told him to follow him, and this is what he got, and fine, I'm going to a better place. I don't know if you think he's going to a better place, whatever. Red finds mother under the church, cuts her head off, throws it at Sand, who preaches at him first, and then when he's dead to rights... I'll suck your dick. Yeah. Which apparently some real person said that in a desperate moment. Here's this guy who thinks he's tough and the leader of everybody. Probably realizes they're all dead now, though. He's got no one else to lead. And you'll say anything to get out of a death situation. But instead, Red crushes his skull. Again, impossible. So I say maybe none of this happened after Mandy's burned alive and he probably should have bled out sitting there with barbed wire around him. Nobody can crush your skull. I read that after the Game of Thrones episode where the mountain does it to the, what's his name now? The Viper. That even a guy that big and that strong could not crush a skull. Our okay, heads are a lot stronger than that. He kills him through the fingers through the eyes. Isn't that how he died? He, but it's, he, he does crush, crush the skull. We need to argue the minutia of Game of Thrones. No, but, but Red does it here and he's not even as big as the mountain or as strong. And he sets the church on fire. We get a flashback to the meeting. And you mentioned already they see each other. Well, he sees her in the car. He had said earlier about having a bad dream. So that's why I wonder, too, about if what we watch for not two hours, but probably an hour and a half-ish. You said that she dies around the hour mark. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think it's earlier than that. But we don't see the title Mandy until something like an hour and 18 minutes into the movie. Yeah, there's the three acts of the film, and they have names. There's Shadow Mountain... The Children of... The New Dawn. The New Dawn. And Mandy is the third part. Mm. But the third part starts, Mandy, she's dead. Everything is happening because of her. The name of the film is Mandy. None of this would be happening if she wasn't so wonderful. Timeline-wise, though, I think she'd been dead for quite a while when you see Mandy come on screen. Yeah, title. it's like when he sets out on his revenge, he's done preparing. But she's been dead for a while before that happens because this yeah. is a very long movie. <laughs> well, it isn't long, but it's two hours. could be 90 minutes. Not really complaining, though. Yeah, I don't think it was too long. I don't think it overstays his welcome at all. The other thing that makes it so surreal at the very end is when he does see her sitting there and has that look on his face, which I think was one of the poster shots. Well, the poster of this movie actually is really cool. Harkens back to the 80s, which makes sense. But we see outside when he's driving... And that is so surrealistic. Saturn is right there or something like it's, that. You know what it is? It's totally, if you ever read pulpy paperback science fiction novels, it is the cover of a pulpy paperback science fiction novel or from a, the 80s specifically. Or a heavy metal album cover. Yeah, maybe that too. But that style of art, which was popular with heavy metal, was also popular with science fiction. She reads science fiction. She's obviously interested in space. They have that lovely conversation about their favorite planets, and she talks about Jupiter. I yeah. like Saturn. <laughs> So Nicolas Cage, we've covered now seven times. Fast Times, Ridgemont High is in that a little bit. Moonstruck, Raising Arizona, both in 1987. Wild at Heart, Adaptation, which may be my favorite Cage movie of all time. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, where he's a voice, of course. He won an Oscar, of course, for Leaving Las Vegas in 1995. That's almost 30 years ago, though. And he's been married five times. Apparently, he was fucked up going into the production of this because his 13-plus year marriage to Alice Kim fell apart right before shooting. And I guess he put a lot of that into the performance, which suggests that she left him. So he was heartbroken. 13 mm -hmm. years, man. Even if you're so bad at marriage that you've done it five times, that's crazy you heartbreak. You probably think that's for real. Like I say, he's 60 now this year. So if that's seven or eight years ago, he was in his early 50s. He's probably thinking, this is the one now. I've been with her for a long time. I don't want to get married again. I'm not 35 anymore. He'd married Lisa Marie Presley. He'd married Patricia Arquette. Those didn't last very long. Now he's with this woman for that long and then doesn't last anyway. I think he's been married, I guess it must be twice since, because it's five marriages in total. Man, you got to give him credit. He never gives up. <laughs> never stops marrying, yeah. Andrea Riseborough got that controversial Oscar nomination a couple years ago for To Leslie, which is a good performance and a good movie, but... It's an okay movie. Well, a good performance anyway. 
We covered her in Birdman, and she's in Battle of the Sexes, which Chris and I covered on Scoring at the Movies quite a few years ago. She's so natural and so gifted, and she creates these really unique characters that makes her work look invisible. Cause she'll disappear in a role, and she's a bit of a chameleon. You know, it's hard to get noticed when you're in a film with Nicolas Cage. She is one of those actresses who's just so natural and gifted, and she creates these really unique characters. Her work looks invisible because she's a bit of a chameleon, and she's just such a lovely actress. It's a shame her performance in this movie gets overlooked, because there really is no Mandy without Mandy. Yeah. I keep on speculating about Elijah Wood. Maybe would have been. And I don't know if he would have been. But if he was, huge eyes, huge eyes, the two of them. <laughs> he might be able to pull it off because he can definitely be a weird little guy. Mm-hmm. I just don't know if he has the physicality to be read. No, I don't think so either. Linus Roche, like I said, was Thomas Wayne in Batman Begins. And Richard Brake was Joe Chill in that same movie. Brake works a lot with Rob Zombie, by the way, if I didn't mention that already. And so I must have seen him plenty of times. I forget what roles he has. I've seen, I think, everything Rob Zombie's made. Devil's Rejects is a movie like this, a harkening back to a long-ago era with a lot of blood and gore, but a movie I like anyway. I like blood and gore anyway, but I do want it to mean something, and in both cases it does. And while talking about movies that this movie's homaging, I can't believe we haven't mentioned Texas Chainsaw Massacre yet, even when we talked about the chainsaw scene. I'm about to. Okay, okay, bring it. (laughs) I guess it's Olwen F-O-U-E-R-E with accent aigus on the two E's. So what's that make it? Fuere? I cannot say that name. (laughs) She was in the See, we butcher names in all languages. <laughs> Owen. <laughs> She's mother. She was in The Northman, another big violent movie, which we liked more than a lot of people did. It was not a hit. It was a couple years ago. But she also plays Sally in that awful 2022 Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I fucking hated that movie so much. And I'm a Texas Chainsaw, especially the original fan. I even like some of the sequels. And I've seen the remake, and I've liked it more after I've seen it a few times. But that one was just terrible. But yes, chainsaws and that, chainsaws and this. This probably has more chainsaw action in that one fight scene yeah. than that one does in total because he doesn't really use the chainsaw that much in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, and I think the Black Skulls have to be at least a little bit, not homaging it, but it's in that same family of a type of villain. Yeah. Ned Dennehy plays Swan. He was in Ridley Scott's Robin Hood and he was in a Harry Potter flick. Not a lot of other big titles that I want to point out here. And then Bill Duke, who was so cool in Predator. And he's also in X-Men The Last Stand. I thought we'd covered him in something, but I didn't see anything on his resume. We should have probably covered Predator a couple years ago or at some point, but we haven't done that. Maybe we will one day. Panos Cosmatos did direct Beyond the Black Rainbow before this, and then an episode of Guillermo del Toro's series we watched was a Cabinet of Curiosities. We saw that, I think it was either late last year or sometime this year. No, it couldn't have been this year. It must have been last year. He is the son of George Cosmatos, who did direct Tombstone, also Cobra, the Stallone movie in the 80s, and one of the Rambo movies for Stallone. And this apparently was supposed to be an allegory about the death of his parents. Panos will probably pass his father's achievements one of these days if he keeps on making movies, but he's only made, I think it's just these two. I don't think I wrote down anything else. Well, I didn't write down anything else. I watched something, by the way, of him. I wanted to find out a pronouncer for his name, so I watched a YouTube clip of him talking about movies and records in some store when he was promoting Beyond the Black Rainbow. That's how long ago it was. He's so normal sounding and so normal looking. I guess he was probably raised in America, so he doesn't actually sound, I think it's Greek is what his dad was. I think his dad, if you heard him back in the day, sounded like he was from Greece, but Panos just sounds like a typical... American guy. Yeah, so all he's done, that episode of Guillermo del Toro's show, Mandy and Beyond the Black Rainbow, he's got something upcoming. It's called Necrocosm. They're in pre-production Love on it. this. Well, I think Spelled he, weird, by the he way. probably has a growing army of fans. I think he's the kind of filmmaker that's going to have a cult following and people will see anything he does if they like him. He's so I specific. I liked him seeing him in that six or eight minute video because I do like the fact he's so normal and such a fan. He talked about a few girl singers he's a big fan of, including Carly Rae Jepsen, who I already liked anyway. I love that. And that was one of his favorites at the time, because that was quite a few And Canadian, ago. a nice Canadian connection. Yeah. <laughs> and he talked about some other song. What was it? I think it was Kylie Minogue's song. I thought, I like that song too, and I downloaded it after I watched that. It was Can't Get You Out of My Head. That's we right. were talking about this already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he wrote with Aaron Stewart on. That was his debut, meaning Stewart Ons, Aaron Stewart Ons. And Casper Kelly also wrote. He mostly does TV shows. There were 17 producers, including Elijah Wood, We've covered him quite a few times. He's in Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship, well, the whole series, but we covered Fellowship of the Ring, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And the year after that, he was in Sin City, where he does play a vicious serial killer. That's why I say it's not that he couldn't have been in this movie. Mm. I just struggled to see him in that part, but he can do weirdness. So the movie's 235 to 1. We saw it on Netflix with the intentionally grainy print. It looks awesome in the way he designed it to look, but it does look extremely grainy. And some of these movies we've been watching on Netflix especially just haven't looked that great in our new TV. 
Anyway, this had a very distinctive look. Benjamin Loeb was the cinematographer. We happened to see Dream Scenario, I think about three days before we watched this, because I got it from the library. I didn't really like it. I would give it a slight thumbs down. I loved the first bit, and I thought it didn't pay off at all. The last maybe hour of that movie even was not that I, great. I Cage was to good. Like it, but Cage was fun, yeah, yeah. but he did shoot that with Cage, of course, and then also Pieces of a Woman that was nominated for an Oscar a couple of years ago. Shit, who's the actress in that? Vanessa. Oh my God, from The Crown and Kirby. Oh, Kirby. 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 Yes, yeah. she's a great actress. I should mm-hmm. know her name. The editors Brett Bachman and Paul Painter, BB PP. Bachman cut Cage's movie Pig, which Cage didn't direct, but. Everyone thinks of it as his movie. And Painter mostly works in TV. But here's a big thing. Johan Johansson, who unfortunately died, by the way. The movie is dedicated to him. He died in February 2018, so a few months before this came out. Loved the music. He was nominated twice in his career, and he worked quite a few times with Denis Villeneuve, including Sicario and Arrival. Do you agree with me that the music was worthy of the I nomination? I love the score, and you know I hate the scores most of the time. But, God, it's just so evocative. Talk about a score that helps truly create the film, the feel, the work of art here. So while we're talking about technicals, I got to talk, of course, about production design, my favorite. Specifically, I want to talk about the two houses. I mean, you see, well, you see more than two houses here. You see Red and Mandy's house, which is this bizarre, unlikely glass house in the middle of the woods with their bedroom as a jutted out glass structure so that they can feel like they're surrounded by the woods and there's just windows everywhere and it's truly so visible and open it looks like somebody just threw a bunch of blocks Hmm. together and it made the shape of a house and you can contrast that with the church of the children of the new dawn which is this really extreme high a-line cabin down in a quarry down in a quarry and there's no windows the only window is the cross yeah. it's the only access to the outside but they're both so the secluded though too yeah both secluded but even that house goes deep underground most of the rooms in that church are underground so it's these opposites do you have his buddies? dingy trailer, which I'm not sure if that's speaking so much to the theme as it is an homage to other movies like this. You mentioned Texas Chainsaw. Well, similar to a movie like that, maybe more so in this case, who's going to stop these people, the Black Skulls from kidnapping them, and then him from getting his revenge? Because if a cop saw this, they'd have to try to stop this guy from killing these people. He doesn't know why he's doing this. Find me a cop, though, out there in the middle of nowhere. And Carruthers Camper as well. Anything could happen out there. And if somebody wants to kill you, they're probably going to do it unless you kill them first. And there's the dichotomy, too, where they're out in the woods to find peace, to find tranquility. At some point, Red senses that something is up and he says to Mandy, should we get away from here? We're somewhere safer. And she's like, no, I don't want to give up our sanctuary here. But it is dangerous. This is a home invasion movie. And next week's movie is, too. What happens next? Well, we already talked about it. I think Lucy maybe gets revenge on him. Probably not. He let her live because he could see that she's probably similar to Mandy. Mandy may have been in their cult as she was willing to accept. She was drugged too. And also, what is it that mother puts on her? A scorpion that stings her? Oh, yeah, yeah. So she is not normal when Jeremiah goes into this whole thing, but she's still able to keep enough of her brain and normal mind to say, no, I don't want to be with you. But maybe Lucy went through the same thing. And Lucy was drugged and thought, yeah, okay, I'll stay with you guys. But then Red can see... She's not part of the problem. So anyway, I'm joking that she would get revenge, but that's fun to think about. What does he do, though? If I was compelled to write a sequel about this movie, which I wouldn't be, but if I was, I would say Lucy and Red meet up somewhere and maybe they're going to kill each other, but then they decide they should team up instead. Make babies. Maybe they find solace in each other, but go, I don't know, find revenge on someone else. Mm. Go be revenge for hire. (laughs) Revenge on this cult. Right then, last thoughts on Mandy, our, what is it, fourth movie, fifth movie, whatever, I think it's fourth movie in Revenge Month. Big not for everybody disclaimer, of course, but I think that if you love film and you have an open mind about art at all, you just got to be grateful to see something with this much guts and vision that reached a widish audience. Not really. And, but more than an art film like this would normally ever get. It's a miracle that anybody saw this movie, let alone that it made, you said, $2 million? Not even. I feel like it has a place in the culture. It is a movie that got talked about a lot. Yeah, Netflix has it. Also, so did I just think that Canopy. it comes up a lot. Netflix and Canopy had this yeah. movie. That, although I think it went off Canopy the day we were going to watch it. So luckily Netflix still did have it. Yeah. It was not hard to find think pieces and reviews and podcasts about Mandy. People love to talk about it. So I think that it has cemented its place in the culture. And I'm always grateful for that kind of thing. So Panos, Cosmatos, stay weird and let me join your cult. <laughs> 
It's a 90 minute story that takes its sweet time. As such, not a lot actually happens over the course of two hours. And I say this as somebody who's a very big fan of it. I'm not really criticizing. There's an obvious dreamlike quality, and maybe most of it isn't even real. Maybe Red dies and imagines this. It's funny, too, when people do this in these movies, how much they suffer when they get the revenge. But you have to make it seem like this could actually be real. So you can't just blow through everybody, and it's easy. Because if it's going to be a subtext or a thought that maybe this isn't real, it can't be obvious that it isn't real. That's a great point. I never thought about that before. But you're right. It's a real staple in revenge films that the angel of vengeance has to do a lot of suffering. And a lot of times they die, too. Yeah. Yeah, because Matos may not be for general audiences, but the man's an artist. This is more of a mood and a vibe. Yeah. And obviously a nightmare than it is a narrative. As for Cage, other actors probably could have played Red. But would anybody have been any better for the role than he is? I don't think so. So that was how we saw Mandy. On Friday, I'll be back in your beautiful ear holes, and I'll be all on my own. That solo show will be a movie with revenge in the title. We had Coralie Farjeet's powerful revenge last year during this month, so I figured I had to get at least one movie with that specific word in this year's Month of Vengeance. But we're going to lighten things up considerably because I'll be monologuing about Revenge of the Nerds. God, you never told me this. <laughs> I changed this movie so many times. I was going to do Death Wish, and I thought it was available on Prime, and then it wasn't. When's the last time you watched Revenge of the Nerds? Oh, not that long ago. Okay. I bet I laugh at it still. <laughs> but I got Revenge in there. I think maybe next year we'll do Revenge of the Sith. We'll see. Next week will be the last time Bev will be talking to you for a little while. She's having foot surgery in early April, so she'll already be in recovery mode a few weeks before we post this episode. Never mind the ones at the end of April. And while I'll tackle quite a few flicks on my own between April 29th and sometime in May... Bev's not taking that break just yet. So in seven days, she and I will be talking about another man on a wicked mission as we review Peck and Mitchum in the 1962 version of Cape Fear. I'm sure Scorsese's 1991 one will come up quite a lot too, but this specifically is the 62 one, another home invasion movie. The coming attractions trivia question for Cape Fear. Gregory Peck wasn't known to star in a lot of lurid thrillers or action films, but he did sometimes make movies like that. And he does have three motion pictures that are ranked on the AFI's Top 100 Thrills. Cape Fear is one of them. What are the other two? All right, so for the answer to that question, check out next week's podcast about Cape Fear. You already know how to find us, but let me remind you to favorite or subscribe wherever you listen, which is also where you can find our archive of hundreds of episodes that are available for free. But perhaps in exchange, you can leave us a rating and a review. That is a great way to support the podcast. We're both on Twitter. I'm at Bev Ellis Ellis and Ryan is at MovieFiend51. You can also reach us by email. Have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com? And I'm on threads, by the way, at Bev Ellis Ellis. And you can find our podcast on YouTube. Our channel is at H-Y-E-S Ellis. And to enjoy freshly roasted premium coffee delivered straight to you in Canada or the U.S., please go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S and enjoy a 20% discount. I'm going to the bathroom now and just do some yelling and some drinking <laughs> and then some killing. <laughs> and cut.